this afternoon is on policy considerations. Uh, so we've heard throughout the day whole series of issues uh, arising, I'll call it from the implementation or implementation questions um, with notice and choice, from readability, whether uh, it's effective consent. Um, I thought Fred, uh, Fred Kate this morning, aside from shocking me in his call for legislation, <laughs> um, raised an interesting point uh, where he was referring to the illusion of consent. And the interesting point I think that raises is the, the, the fundamental issue about the effectiveness of the notice and choice framework and how that uh, framework aligns with some of the harms perceived by consumers and then what we do about it from a policy um, point of view. Uh, Sean, in just the last panel, um, said, I love the quote, people and policy matter, that they go together. Um, I'm going to tee up our, our, our conversation uh, with uh, just a quick uh, snapshot of some research uh, that we've been doing at Fordham in connection with the Usability Privacy Project, um, looking to see what matters to consumers and regulators from the perspective of enforcement actions. It's how enforcement actions are informing uh, what people find offensiveness in the privacy practices. And then we can talk during our, our dialogue about, you know, what does that mean for the policy considerations. Um, after I tee it up, we're going to have, we'll bring all of our panelists up. Um, they'll talk for just a, a couple of minutes on some opening um, remarks. And then we want to have a uh, robust dialogue and, and Q&A. Um, unfortunately, I think when we were sharing some of our bullet points, there's more agreement than we probably should have on this. That may be a good thing from a policy point of view. Um, so I think when we get into the dialogue, we'll want to try to get into some specific examples and try to think very concretely, what is it that policymakers need? What is it that the business community needs? And what do consumers need? Um, so just on um, the, the, the study that we did was uh, one of privacy enforcements. We looked at all of the class action privacy, all of the class action litigation involving online privacy claims um, for approximately a 10 year period. We essentially went back to the first one uh, that was filed. And we looked at all of the Federal Trade Commission's uh, settlements involving online, pri online privacy claims. And we mapped out, in looking at these cases and FTC actions, we mapped out the type of harms or the privacy offenses um, that these enforcement actions were addressing. And we found that they really fell into four kinds of categories. Um, unauthor the unauthorized disclosure of personal information, uh, surreptitious collection, inadequate security, and then an improper or wrongful retention. Um, on the FTC cases, it's probably not surprising you see the green, uh, is those are security claims. Um, on the litigation side, it turned out to be, we really found it was the same set of um, offenses or harms, though it flips. Uh, the most significant one turned out to be surreptitious collection. So when we think about these kinds of harms that are being shown by, you know, what people care enough to sue over, um, when you map it out, we think it reflects a series of policy implications. Um, in the two of the areas, Notice and choice can map to, to be helpful. Um, the two areas are unauthorized disclosure and surreptitious collection. So to the extent that you can provide more, more clear descriptions uh, of the information uses, um, that can ameliorate the unauthorized disclosure problem. The surreptitious collection, again, it's, it's dis disclosing what you're doing. Um, yet, in each of those cases, you still have zones where, you know, spread term, there's an illusion of consent. There still may be an underlying unfairness, even if you disclose it. But significantly, in two of the areas, um, security and retention, notice and choice really don't resolve this. Right? It, it, you can tell people that you have um, security or good security, but if it still doesn't work, right, so what, the notice and choice is really beside the point. Um, likewise with retention. Um, in a way, it's irrelevant what you tell people about retention if you're holding on to the data for a wrongfully long period of time or you're not holding on to it when you should have been holding on to it. It doesn't matter what you disclosed. You still have the underlying problem. So it really reflects this research is beginning to show that the range of effectiveness, sort of what's the scope in which it can work at all, let alone 
deal with many of the problems we spoke about this morning is really going to be a very important part of the policy debate um, going forward. So I'm going to stop there and ask our uh, panelists to come on up. Um, and we will have them, um, I have like a, a little order, an effort to the madness. Um, I was, our, we have a, a terrific set of panelists. We have, uh, let's start wherever you sit, you sit. Uh, oh, I was sitting in my Where are you? Door. Okay. <laughs> So, um, I'll I will introduce them, I guess, in the order they're seated, but I'm going to have them speak in a slightly different order. Uh, so we have Ian Fett at the, at the far end, um, who is uh, with Google, uh, works as an engin engineering manager um, with Google. Next to him is uh, Gautam Hans, who is the Plesser Fellow at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, we have Michelle Chiba from the Ontario Privacy Commission uh, and Joanne McNabb from the Office of the California Attorney General. Um, I'm going to ask Gotan to start us off. We're going to each will talk for just a couple minutes on some key points and, and then we'll launch into the debate. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, hi, I'm Gotan Hans. I'm an attorney at the Center for Democracy and Technology where I work on the consumer privacy team. Um, I uh, Joe Hall, who's our chief technologist, and I uh, co-wrote a position paper, which you can find on the website, um, which sort of sets out our views on the subject, which, you know, obviously, as we've discussed today, is of critical importance um, to consumers uh, using online services. There's a couple things that I wanted to highlight from the paper um, and uh, pull out as the things that we think are really critical in terms of why this is an important policy issue. Primarily, um, you know, we talked a lot about the challenges when there is a choice here today, and when some claim that um, it's a principle that may not be relevant or may not be useful in certain contexts, <coughs> precisely because it's perhaps not been operationalized effectively today, our view on that is rather that the lack of effective oper oper lack of effective uh, creation of notice and choice principles um, means that the solution is not to disregard the principle, but rather to figure out ways in which to communicate it more effectively. Now, that's obviously a big policy challenge, and um, we recognize that. But throwing the baby out of the bathwater is not something that we really advocate for. And one of the reasons for that is that the ways in which services change their um, terms and the ways in which they're communicated to users historically have um, led to a lot of consumer uproar and misinformation or misunderstanding. Um, without, you know, I think the most uh, well-known examples of that are, are known to most of you, so I won't go through that, but I think the need for effective notice and choice and effective communication of use and collection and retention of data em is emphasized by the consumer concern. Uh, if consumers didn't care about it, I don't think you would see the, the volume and the um, consistency of that concern being raised. The final point I think that I will emphasize before turning it over um, to our other panelists is that we talk a lot about, um, in the policy community, about how to communicate information. And there are various ways in which of doing that. Um, I was part of the NTA multi-stakeholder process on the web transparency, which was discussed earlier today. And in that meeting, there was a lot of discussion about icons versus nutrition labels versus short form versus you know, other ways of communicating information. Um, I am a policy attorney and I have a master's in information. I am not a computer scientist, I am not a communications person, I'm not a psychologist. But I will say that many of the people um, in the NTA process were very uh, blasé about how easy it is to communicate information. And I think that the research that we've uh, seen today emphasizes that communication of information is complicated and it requires a lot of user testing and probably shouldn't be made by policy attorneys sitting in a conference room somewhere in D.C. As a policy attorney, often sits in conference rooms in D.C. I'm uh, qualified to say that. Um, although this may disagree with me. Uh, that means that the research that we've discussed today, I think, is um, really important and is real, where the re real value is in terms of how we can uh, promote effective errors and choice uh, going forward. Great, thank you. Um, Michelle, do you want to pick up? Okay. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ditto with the exception that, um, so, so A, first of all, um, I have to disclose, I, I'm coming from Canada, right? The Great White North. Um, the second disclosure is, you know, coming from a regulatory office where in Ontario we see, or we oversee the privacy access, you know, the whole compliance area. Uh, the third is, um, I, I, I often call our office and even our commissioner unconventional. Right? We're very unconventional uh, because I'm coming from the policy and special projects uh, department. I head that up. Very different from our tribunal that hears all the complaints. So I have to do the disclaimer like everybody else does. Anything that I say cannot be taken as legal advice, nor if there's a complaint that comes before us, you know, whatever I say cannot be used to support your whatever, defense, right? <laughs> but you're all here in the U.S., so it doesn't matter, right? Um, and in any case, uh, I, I, I think what, what we want to say is, you know, we've been reading about your, your um, privacy draft consumer bill of rights. We like that. It encompasses the holistic fair information practices as a full program. It's a holistic approach to privacy. And we see that is, as a good thing. Um, we also see privacy by design fitting in there. And, and what do I mean by privacy by design? There are two fundamental aspects that sort of modernize what we call the FIPS. It's A, being proactive, and it's being proactive about privacy, whether or not it's technology, business process, policies, controls, whatever, or even in the physical design area. So it's being proactive. It's thinking about privacy early in order to prevent the harms. I mean, we know that harms will exist. We know that we need regulation and enforcement and penalties. But I think the more that we can move toward prevention is much better for all of us. We're all civil here, aren't we? Um, and I think the other piece to privacy by design is the whole win-win. You know, um, I, I've been in the office for over 10 years now, and I can remember when I first came in, the, the, it was like, oh my gosh, a regulator. No one would come and talk to us. Right? They'd be going, ooh, and they'd only have to be forced to come and talk to us if there was a complaint or an investigation. But in line with privacy by design, we had to actually adopt what we called our MO, which was the three C's, communication, collaboration, and consultation. And it's taken that amount of time for us to engender that kind of relationship with various organizations who come to us and say, you know, give us your views. What do you think? They're not asking for an endorsement or whether or not they'll prevent a breach, but at least they can come and brainstorm us and how we can actually share problem solving across different domains, right? We find that very, very helpful. So the other one that we want to talk about is if we have the user or the consumer taking on much more responsibility in the consent area, right? What to do with their information in a complex environment where maybe, why should we all have to get a PhD in engineering or computer science, right? We're looking at things, we're borrowing from another domain and there was a, a, a great um, initiative that came out of the FPF and it was Create with Context and so we borrowed some of those principles which are context, awareness, right? You have to be aware that there's something there that, that you can utilize to protect your privacy, discoverability, just because you are aware of it doesn't mean that you can find it. I will say that there are some sites where they don't want you to log out. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, I was trying to find, well, how do I log out, right? So you have to be able to discover these things. And then there's comprehension, and I think that's what we've been talking about today. You know, how, how do you get this consumer understanding and knowledge, right? And then, we talked about the consumer-centric tools, and I think we, we, we could discuss a lot of examples, a lot of the research here, um, which has been fabulous. And I think um, our commissioner is still our commissioner until Monday, and, and the message she would want me to give you is, she loves you all, engineers who are doing this fabulous <laughs> research, and she would cry it out to the world, the value that you're bringing. Um, as engineers in computer science and behavioral scientists and other researchers. So that's the end of my few points.
That's great. I can just hear Anne Kamukian saying that too. <laughs> um, right. I have to, I have to channel her. Right. I still have to channel her till Monday. <laughs> Ian. So as long as we're doing disclaimers, um, I'll say I'm in charge of security and privacy for Google Apps, which is a frightening title. But I am very much an engineer, not a lawyer, so all those wonderful disclaimers apply. In terms of points that I wanted to make, um, I think oh, my phone is scrolled. Um, number one, I think we have to be aware of the fact that people's perceptions of privacy and what is acceptable with respect to privacy change over time. And so I think to the extent that we talk about legislation, uh, requirements for notice and choice, um, social norms, I think we have to be aware of the fact that we are in somewhat of a, uh, a shifting landscape. You know, 50 years ago, credit reporting as it exists today was not computerized. You know, people say it started about 100 years ago, but 60s and 70s when uh, the credit reporting became computerized, certainly the amount of information that was collected increased dramatically. I'm not sure that I can give a first-hand account of how that was received at the time, but you know, today, I have to imagine that the way we think about credit reporting agencies, yes, we're still a little scared about are there inaccuracies in our credit reports, but as a whole, as a, as a society, we accept that these practices serve a valid purpose they allow us to get credit cards and loans. And so our privacy views about what is acceptable in terms of the data that gets collected and how it's used change over time. And so I think what we have to do is ensure that we stay, um, that we do things in a way that allow us that flexibility to realize that privacy is not necessarily a fixed point in time, but it is a shifting landscape. Um, secondly, I think as a result of that, we need to have a clearer understanding before we legislate I was involved in the do not track process for, I don't even know how many years at this point, and um, it was a while. And we actually got to a point where we had no definition of what tracking actually meant. We had no definition of how a website should specify whether it tracked you. We had no real way of, like, people were still saying, oh, the browser should do this, the browser should do that. And in the midst of all that, we had legislation come up saying that you had to post a policy about what you do with Do Not Track. And at the time, we didn't even know what Do Not Track was. Um, and so I think we have to be careful about the cart coming before the horse in some of this. And we really need to spend time getting a common understanding around what are acceptable practices, what are not acceptable practices, uh, before, we, before we move to legislation. Um, I think that. There's also a difference between, in the do not track world, we call it first party, third party. I don't think that's really the right way to look at it. But there's things that users know that they're interacting with. I log into Google. I log into Facebook. I log into Microsoft. I understand that I'm having a relationship with them. And I think in those contexts, notice and choice is still entirely valuable. I actually can understand through any of the tools that people are developing here, or even through privacy policies, I can attempt to understand what is happening to my data. I can choose, if I don't like Google, I can go to Yahoo, I can go to Microsoft, I can choose an alternate provider in many cases. So I think their notice and choice is valuable. I think where it starts to break down is in cases where I don't have a direct relationship. Things like I'm walking down the streets of London and there's video cameras everywhere and I have no idea what's happening to that data, how it's being used, how long it's being stored. I think their notice and choice uh, is not sufficient to meet and have a broader dialogue as a society about what we're willing to accept and what we're not willing to accept. And when we have that dialogue, I think we need to focus on tangible harms that come out of responsible or irresponsible data use. We need to focus on preventing those actual tangible or quantifiable harms. I think this is a difference between how we look at things in the United States and how we look at things in Europe is historically uh, regulation in the United States has been focused around harms or remedying harms, whereas in Europe it's more focused on um, do you have, what legislation gives you the right to do something, where does your right to do data processing stem from, and I think that as we move quickly in technology and new, new services, new companies, um, new technologies are developed, 
I think we have to be careful not to over-legislate so as not to cut off future, uh, future developments. Uh, I, was, I was encouraged by the last PCAST report, uh, sorry, um, the PCAST report basically said that policy attention should focus more on specific uses of big data and less on the actual collection analysis. They said that PCAST judges that policies focused on the regulation of data collection, storage, retention, a priori limitations on applications and analysis, absent identifiable actual uses of the data, are unlikely to yield effective strategies for improving privacy. Such policies would be unlikely to be scalable over time or to be enforceable by other than severe and economically damaging measures. I think one of the things that I also took out of the report was that policies and regulations should be stated in terms of intended outcomes, not necessarily specific technologies. We should avoid technology-specific mandates so that we allow for that future innovation and don't lock things in. I think anonymization is an example that comes up very frequently. You can try to specify an anonymization algorithm, but that turns out very difficult to do in all contexts. And so really what we want to talk about is the anonymization properties that we want to come out of one of those, um, what it means to be anonymized. Uh, and so just to wrap up, I think what we really need are more open discussions and a forum for those discussions to talk about what is acceptable use of data, not just in the first party context where we can actually have this notice and choice, and I think it works well there, but in the broader societal context where maybe I don't have that direct relationship, it's an ATM camera I'm walking by, it's municipal surveillance, coming up with a shared understanding as a society of what is acceptable and not acceptable. I'm looking forward to the discussion part of this thing. Um, I'm with the California Attorney General's Office uh, with the Privacy, let me see, I gotta get this, Privacy Enforcement and Protection Unit. So we are the enforcers and the educators on privacy in California. And uh, I want to make a case for the benefit and value to consumers of the long privacy policy that nobody reads. The comprehensive privacy policy that, and I would distinguish that from privacy notice, from a privacy notice using that as a noun here, uh, which I, I think in, for my terminology, a privacy notice is a shorter, contextual, potentially just-in-time uh, way to get people's attention to practices that may be surprising or sensitive or concerning in some way. And the comprehensive privacy policy is the, the bigger picture description of uh, an organization's practices regarding data such as, although it isn't totally comprehensive, the one required by California law of every operator of a commercial website or online service. So the values, the thing that makes this valuable to the consumers who don't read it, a couple of points. One is the requirement to make such a policy to be transparent about practices to the degree, to the degree that the law requires it actually encourages uh, some degree of data governance inside of organizations. Uh, I, I hear this from privacy officers. I have myself been involved with some government agencies and assisting them in doing this. And uh, often a privacy officer charged with having, managing and being responsible for governing data practices um, finds it very challenging to figure out what their data practices are, as we heard from some earlier uh, speakers. And, the requirement to disclose this all can be very helpful to, to building a structure to then manage what it is. Uh, the requirement to disclose it also can encourage rethinking some practices in some cases. So that's one benefit. It also has a, a degree of accountability, therefore, which is good, which we as regulators like, and which consumers expect us to be doing, as a matter of fact. I also think that uh, a, a, a comprehensive privacy policy is likely to be particularly valuable when it comes to the Internet of Things, sort of counter to the, the big, big data idea, uh, the, the PCAST statement, which was making a different point. Um, it, 
it's going to be very difficult to uh, deliver a privacy policy or a notice on a refrigerator or you know many other uh, networked things but such a policy can be available online just as now I frequently go to websites to look up the owner's manual for some product I bought it can also be possible to go to the website to look up what the data practices are I'm not saying this is notice but it's transparency even uh, though consumers don't as we keep hearing generally read these policies the information still does get to them. They can certainly be made more comprehensive. They can certainly be made to address more than is currently legally required, to address more of the issues of concern to consumers, such as data retention, such as data uses, beyond just the categories of, of PII collected and the third parties to must disclose. So they can be made more informative. They can be made more comprehensible. And that the information in them can reach consumers, even though they don't read them. I think a very good example of an intermediary bringing the contents of, of a comprehensive privacy policy to consumers is the neat little banking tool that was developed right here. I actually stumbled upon that by myself and uh, checked out banks in my area. My bank must not be using that, that standard format, but I found a lot of interesting things about the practices of banks. Um, the, the media and others are also intermediaries, intermediaries that uh, can you bring the information in a comprehensive policy to the, the users who are not reading it. Uh, it is, is critical that, that the policies cover more than they are currently required to cover, that they address more of the issues. And I brought a few copies of our uh, recommend practices, best practices guide. There, there are some out there, as many as I could carry about 35, um, which begin from the, the uh, foundation of the California Online Privacy Protection Act, but then go beyond and make recommendations beyond mere legal compliance for including more information, and also for uh, format that makes, makes uh, policies more accessible to anybody who's looking at them. And I, I am definitely interested in reviewing this at some point in the future and maybe making some more uh, changes in the area, areas of format, such as some of the issues that were raised by many of your papers, much of, like, I thought the work on, on framing and how the choices are framed is really critical and could be, could be very useful to people. So that's what I wanted to say, and um, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Great. Um, let me start it out. Uh, I'm actually going to pick up something that um, Ian said about changes in perception over time. Um, and particularly, I, I confess I thought the credit reporting example is an extremely ironic one to use um, because in 1968, the U.S. Congress had a committee called the Committee on Invasions of Privacy that held two years of hearings on the credit reporting industry, which was a mess and it culminated in the 1970 Fair Credit Reporting Act. Fast forward 26 years later, 1996, and you had in, in, in the 1960s, the 68, the hearings, um, industry was, was decrying um, the notion that there would be regulation. It was actually a very diverse industry, a lot of little players, a uh, lot of inaccurate information circulating around, inaccessible information. Consumers had no way of figuring out who was selling their credit report, um, and the industry players were very upset with that. 1996 rolls around, uh, which was the first major uh, update to, to the statute. The same industry players now were saying, thanks to the Credit Reporting Act, we have the most robust credit reporting system in the, United, in the world, that our credit system works. Why? Because the Credit Reporting Act enabled consumers to trust the industry. It imposed on the industry a degree of fairness, transparency, access, a whole host of things um, that seem to be what everybody's complaining about we don't have right now in, in this environment. So it's sort of I ironic, I think, in, in that instance, when you look at the, at the testimony in 96 and the, then again in 2003 in FACTA, uh, which was the last reform we had of that statute, um, all of the, the industry players were attributing the statute to the success of the industry. Um, so it's sort of an interesting um, flip to it. And where it leads me is I wonder in this context, I think back of Alessandro's examples this morning, 
where, you know, depending on quite how you mix and match, you can really push people to go against what they might otherwise, what they otherwise would really desire. Um, yeah. How do we, from a policy side, what, what are the, in, what are the mechanisms, what, what should we be doing to incentivize the right choices, right, the right infrastructure, the privacy by design. You talked about context, you know, the, ha having these tools available. Well, that's great, but what is the infrastructure that's needed to incentivize it? What, Rashad, you want to start? Okay, so we'll start. And it's going to seem odd coming from a regulator that we would say regulation alone would do it. Um, I think what, what our office is trying to do is to make the business case that, um, that privacy is important, right? Um, we've found, and I, I don't have the company, but in Europe, for example, there are <coughs> beginnings of companies, app developers and that, who are actually using um, their privacy features uh, as a distinguisher, right? And, and you heard Microsoft, you heard Facebook up here saying they're not doing it for the money. They're doing it for the relationship to the consumer, that long trusted relationship. And we have seen situations where businesses go out of business. I can tell you, and from different perspectives, I mean, look at Lumen, right? Look at what happened there. It was a privacy issue that, that took them down. I mean, who wants to see that? Um, there's another one I can tell you. Um, Nebuat, they wanted to do deep packet inspection um, from the ad serving perspective. <coughs> but they didn't get it right, right? But they're, and they're no longer here. So what we'd like to do is to say, we think, we think privacy is a business issue, right? It's it's important, it's not just a bottom line issue, it's that long-standing relationship with your clients, your customers, the consumers who rely on the organizations to uh, do the right thing with their data. Now, can I just say one thing? Are we picking on Ian? <laughs> <laughs> because I just don't want to forget this. I don't. He, he talked about you know, this focus, on use. After. <laughs> <laughs> focus on use and not collection. I can tell you that if, if they came to Canada and did that, we'd say, uh, 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 no, 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 no. You have to justify every single collection of PI. No different than any other organization that would come to us would have to justify why every camera was put up. Give me the stats. Justifiability, proportionality, why would you be collecting biometrics for, for you know, like a, a swimming pool entry, right? And, and, and putting those biometrics at risk in terms of, of authentication. So our view is focusing on just the use because somebody's got to then make that determination is highly paternalistic, right? And that's what we would be calling out against is privacy paternalism in this case. So I'll respond first to your original question, which I think was um, what would help in this situation. And I think what would help the most today, um, you know, Google, we've, we've had our incidents. We had Buzz, we had Street View, we had, uh, we've had plenty. <laughs> <laughs> I care to list. Um, one of the good things that did come from the FTC consent decree um, was that we instituted a, a number of privacy programs internally. Um, where now we actually review all of our launches for potential privacy impacts. We document that. Um, we have what we call a privacy working group, and if they, uh, if they identify privacy issues with the launch, that launch gets held up. And someone can still override that, but it's well documented. We understand the risk. It's a conscious decision. I think having more of that across the industry where privacy is something that's explicitly called out when you're launching something. So, so how do you, you just said you did that because of the consent decree. I'm not so saying you did it because of this consent decree, but that's certainly formalized. It helps. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you it get a company that isn't subject to a consent decree? 
um, to make the decision that that kind of internal data governance, which was the term Joanne used, the data, go data governance <laughs> aspect, is actually being internalized in the company. I think um, transparency around sort of, you know, we're not very transparent around what sort of things that we didn't launch got caught by this, but there have been a few that I've been involved in and had to say no on. And I think if we could help other companies understand that this actually is preventing, um, this is preventing real issues, this is preventing loss of user trust, it's preventing investigations, financial, uh, financial consequences. Uh, I think there might be a role for companies like Google, like Facebook, uh, who have some of these practices in place uh, to play more of a leadership role in demonstrating um, really what those programs do. Uh, in terms of what else is needed, I can tell you it's extremely hard to hire qualified computer scientists with a good privacy understanding. Um, we, we, we <laughs> <laughs> That's an advertisement for the Carnegie Mellon program. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I mean, I, I know we're actually hiring one of Laurie's students. Uh, do we have any of Laurie's students here in that program? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> jobs? We're, we're, we've actually hired one of them. Um, <laughs> but Laurie Norman. Excuse me, Laurie Norman. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, you know, it's not something that is typically found, especially at the undergraduate level. Uh, you get the foundations of computer science, which seem to be about how you manipulate the data and not the respect that you give it. Um, so I think that's, that's something that's lacking in, in education that would certainly help. Um, and, you know, there are programs out there for, there's CIPP, but to be honest, you go through CIPP and it tells you things about password policy and you should change your password. It's not, it's not quite designed for someone coming with a CS degree from Carnegie Mellon to go through. Uh, so I think those are two areas where we could really improve as a, as a larger group. Um, you know, one of the things at CDT that we're sort of um, trying to focus on uh, over the next few months um, is identifying the problem, right? So the problem necessarily is not with companies like Google or Microsoft or Facebook that are technology companies that have a lot of experience in, in data, data collection, and the issues that arise from that. I think the two constituencies that we've identified that, um, or at least two, there are probably more as well, that um, really need to focus on creating these sort of internal governance <coughs> models that we've been talking about are companies like startups, which um, often are small um, and don't necessarily have anyone who necessarily have a lot of experience um, as a CPO or any other kind of privacy governance person. And then increasingly, traditional large companies that increasingly are becoming technology companies. Um, uh, our president, Neil O'Connor, often says, you know, every company these days is becoming a technology company. You see this in the internet of his context, but you also see in, you know, education, healthcare, the home, the car, all these different traditional companies that now have a relationship with the consumer that is not just the uh, providing a product or a service, but also collecting data, doing analytics, um, continuing to interact with consumer after um, the purchase is made. So what we are interested in doing is sort of doing more outreach and, and not just the consumer education angle, but also the company education angle, right? So the, the value proposition, I think, is the trust that was um, emphasized on the previous panel. And you know, without that, you don't really get people wanting to use those services, whether it's an app or a you know, networked device or you know, an online service um, for healthcare or for education. So I, I think the way to incentivize it is to make it easy for those resources to think about, um, in thinking about how to structure a data governance program, to make that resource easy and digestible to the company that you're trying to provide it to, and, and tailoring it depending on what that company's needs are. You know, some, you know, car, I can imagine that a networked car obviously will have particular location issues that you know another service provider may not have. So you know, being mindful that this, there's no one size fits all solution. There has to be some flexibility in, in how we structure those um, internal programs and figuring out uh, what specific details in each industry is, I think, um, really important. I also will say that we talked a, a little bit about regulation, but I think enforcement is sort of the other side of, of the coin in, in terms of um, incentivizing companies to think about uh, you know, how they communicate their practices and what those practices are. An example I point to quite frequently is the FTC set on the path last year, I think for $900,000 for um, FTC and COPPA violations. 
So this is an example of where a company was collecting data, didn't realize it, and then uh, was faced with an enforcement action from the FTC and a sizable fine, which I'm sure was not something they wanted to happen. Um, that is the situation that Path had when it was collecting address data um, from users without notifying them. I think highlights a couple of things. One, that privacy by design is a really important issue, but also collection in its, in and of itself is really important to think about. Um, and I uh, think Michelle, I think, would um, disagree with me a little bit about the PCAS report, which I found to be, frankly, quite troubling. And it's uh, this topic view of a world where collection is constant. Um, the Taylor Rodriguez anecdote, I think, unsettled me and others um, with my work with a sort of blase attitude towards collection. Uh, last year, Justin Brooklyn, uh, who heads our Consumer Privacy Project, and I wrote a paper for the Future Privacy Forum about why collection in and of itself is an important issue to be thoughtful of. Um, the data breach issues, government access, internal misuse, there's all sorts of ways in which um, random collection in and of itself implicates privacy interests. Though they may not be characterized as harms necessarily, um, the consumer does have an interest in, in that kind of collection. Well, we, we saw in our, in our research with the class actions, 50, was it 53% of the cases involved surreptitious collection. Mm. The, the, the act of collecting without knowledge was perceived by consumers as wrongful and harmful. John, did you want to add in that? I think uh, just, wanted to as a, an approach to um, bringing about good practices, I'm still hopeful uh, for some kind of co-regulatory scheme. Painful as the NTIA process <laughs> was and, and small as the outcome was, I still think it was a a positive outcome. It was a little step forward. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I, that's one model. I think there can be others. The, we try to do in the Attorney General's office, we try, we try to move it sort of in a co-regulatory, not exactly co-regulatory, but something like that direction by uh, issuing best practice guides, recommended practice guides, uh, developed with in consultation with stakeholders, not just industry stakeholders, but very critically industry stakeholders because we need to be informed and, and also consumer and privacy stakeholders. And we think that you know, we can help to create standards that are not laws, but standards, help to define standards and, and move practices that way. Also, clearly, enforcement can be you know, very educational, as <laughs> we've just heard. Um, but education of businesses and organizations, I think, can, can really be effective. Um, I'd like to go back to something that uh, both Ian and, and, and Garan touched on uh, earlier, uh, which has to do uh, with the fact that uh, you have uh, many of these uh, smaller players that are often responsible for uh, key software. I spend a lot of time looking at mobile apps, for instance. When looking at mobile apps, as we all know, many of them still don't have privacy uh, policies. Uh, and, um, and so I would, I would like to say that in that context, uh, I'm not terribly worried about Google, Facebook, as perhaps others uh, might, might be. They have extremely knowledgeable people, and they have all the resources to, to by and large, uh, do, let's say, the right things, to keep things simple. But when you look at the small guys, you look at mobile apps, uh, most of these mobile apps are built by two guys in garage, literally, that's what the stats, the stats show. These guys certainly do not have, even if they wanted to, they have absolutely no background to write a privacy policy, you know. And I see this firsthand, even in, in my own programs, where I teach uh, privacy and, and mobile commerce, for instance, and I get people to build mobile apps. And I tell them, write a policy about this, and they write a very nice policy. I said, my app is very nice. It doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. that you need to be concerned about. <laughs> and, I, and I ask them, and, and what is that location you're showing there? Are you sharing anything with you know, third parties? And they say, oh, that's just Google Maps. So that's OK. And, you know, and then we continue a conversation. And you're logging in you know, through Facebook. Does that mean anything? So there is very little awareness. And I think that's, the, that's uh, I think a huge source of, of, of risk and, and a huge challenge. And I think that when we're talking about standards and not necessarily regulations, I think there's a, a very significant role to be played by these larger companies that are the center of these ecosystems. Because I think it's absolutely unrealistic to expect the small players to be able to rise to the expectations we have in, in terms of addressing our privacy issues. I think the larger players have, the ones that are at the center of many of these ecosystems, have the ability to provide tools, 
make it much easier uh, for these smaller players to provide meaningful statements about what their policies are. And I'm not just talking about tools to write a privacy policy, I'm talking about the complexity of the value chain, to look at these advertising networks and the commitments that they make or don't make. How do you somehow reduce this back to something that would fit in a single policy that a single guy in a garage right, would somehow be able to convey back to an end user? I think that a company like Google, a company like Facebook, a company like Microsoft is very well placed to potentially build those tools. And we've seen some move in that direction, but I think there's a lot more room uh, for, for uh, seeing more tools to really make that possible. There's a huge gap right there. That, that's been an actual focus of some of our educational efforts. We, a year ago, we did a guide called Privacy on the Go about mobile apps at, that had recommendations for app developers and for other players in the ecosystem, but we followed it up with with workshops for app developers as the sort of at, at a teachable moment. And at the workshops, there would be one panel of lawyers telling them, here are the rules. But the rest of the day was panels of other developers and technologists, including people from Google, um, uh, talking about how they were able to build privacy considerations in. And it, it, this actually started at the basic level of, you got to find out what data your app is collecting. Because since they're built out of components, they actually don't know a good deal of the time. Um, at the last one that we did down in Santa Monica, which is known as Silicon Beach, um, one of the panels was, was two venture capitalists. And they <coughs> talked about uh, the concern that many investors have in a privacy lurch or creepiness or whatever you call them, Jules, um, that imperil, can imperil their investment. And they also talked about the, at last, uh, growing market for privacy enhancing technologies in the wake of the Snowden revelations mm -hmm. and things like Wicker. Uh, and so, I think that's a much better so, message for this group than just hear, so hearing can, lawyers telling telling them what the laws are. Could I throw out that many of the guys in the garage will not come to your workshop? We, we, we did it with the App Developer Associations, and there were guys from the garage, believe me. Okay, but then is, is, is the issue perhaps somewhat shifted? Um, which is, on the, on the one hand, it's you know, having those uh, education things, focusing perhaps on the VCs, because if those apps in the garage, at some point they're going to want capital. If they don't get the capital, they're going to stay small, and there would be de minimis problems that they would cause. On the other hand, if they get big, that's where we worry about the, the infrastructure. So as one of the VCs... collect a lot of data and send it a lot of places. But if, but if only five people have downloaded it. Well, I think you're looking at it the wrong way. I think they get big before they get to the VCs. You look at something like Flappy Bird overnight, yeah. it goes to number one in the App Store, it gets huge. And I think Norman's point is actually well taken. I do think that you know, at that stage, at the stage before you're going for VC money, you're probably operating illegally in San Francisco out of some space that's not even zoned commercially. So I mean I think the point though is that you know we there is an opportunity to say here are the libraries that you're using, here are the APIs that you're calling. We do static analysis on everything that's uploaded in the into the web store. We're looking more for malware than trying to piece together a privacy policy, but I think the opportunity that you point out is actually there. So with this, I'll be a little provocative here. Um, I'm not going to suggest this is my opinion, uh, but in many areas, um, and this is directed perhaps at, at Joanne, in many areas of the law, we see enforcement actions where people are sent to jail to send a message. And it very quickly ripples through every stage of an industry when people actually go to jail. Should that be happening here? <laughs> Should people be going to jail for developing an app that grossly violates privacy in some capacity. Meaning someone gets killed or someone gets a targeted ad? <laughs> same thing. Because those are both the same. Is there a difference? <laughs> That's the point. Well, I think there's also a question of intent. Like, to be honest, a lot of, uh, I think there's a big difference between I am going to surreptitiously slurp up all the contacts on your phone and sell it off to someone versus you know, I'm using some library, I've configured it in some way that I don't understand, so I'm just trying to get the bird to go between the pipes, and therefore yeah. I'm collecting data that maybe I shouldn't well, be collecting, but it's We not have my a doctrine data. of negligent manslaughter, right? Recle recle we have a recklessness standard. If you're so reckless that you're endangering others, 
you can be prosecuted for that, even though you didn't have the intent to do it. You have to find the legal basis. We are very vigorously trying to put some people in jail who are uh, engaged in revenge porn. Um, yeah. And there's a clear it's hard. It's, but even with have, that, it's not yeah. easy. But you have intent there with the revenge porn, and you're clearly intending to harm someone. Um, and I think the question is, Today, like in Canada, I can't call myself a software engineer because I haven't passed a professional engineering exam. Yeah. Uh, in the United States, we don't have that level of licensing. We sort of have this fantasy that anyone can, you know, pop open the garage door and make Flappy Bird and strike it rich. Um, and so I don't know if we want to, that's a very chilling, um, that, that could be very chilling on industry. And I personally don't think that that have, well, well, hold on, look, could, could you have professional standards? Are you suggesting that professional standards would be chilling on industry? I mean, we have that in accounting. If, if what we're talking about now is, use of inf is, is fair use of information, and we've heard that the companies like yours have trouble hiring engineers who recognize what those issues are. We've heard from Norman that the, the app developers in the garage are acting with reckless abandon. Um, is it perhaps is that perhaps a direction that the policy community should be pushing to have essentially professional standards uh, and pr professional licensure? I've seen a lot of professional licensure. I started off in consumer affairs, and it it tends to be a way to limit entry to professions more that, than that's the downside. Yeah. protection. Yes. Yeah. My daughters are 11 and 13. They're building apps. Yeah. <laughs> they're not the only ones at that age that are building apps. And they want to make money. Um, and, and, and so that's what we're dealing with. Do they have defense lawyers lined up? <laughs> <laughs> we're coming for them. <laughs> um, let me say, were there questions out in the audience? Yes. That Alicia, I think, in the back. I don't have a mic, but I think I'm loud enough. Um, so I, I liked your presentation, Joel, and I liked your focus on maybe privacy policies aren't the really important thing to be looking at in some ways. But I noticed that improper retention of personal information is a violation of privacy policies in the United States. That's the only way something becomes improper, right, in most cases, is that companies said they did one thing and did another. Uh, not, not necessarily in the class action cases. They're not, they're not so you're thinking of it in the context of the FTC cases. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, there are fewer, much far fewer retention issues cropping up out of the, SEC, uh, the FTC cases than the class action cases. Because it's almost but never it's mentioned. Kind of, when it comes to the point that I wanted to ask you, like, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have, um, is our focus on notice and choice really an accident of the FTC's authority? No, it pre, I mean it predates. I think it predates. Yes. It's the it's FIPS. I mean we heard you know Fred this morning in his starting referenced the 1980 OECD guidelines that really bought into that. The the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is the earliest privacy legislation, 1970, um, has a set of permissible uses, and then consent is you can consent to any other use. So there's still we started with eight. Sorry? We started with eight. And, that and it's shrunk. We, we, we've tended to really shrink it down to consent. But mm -hmm. you know, we in the United States on the, on the law side are much more willing to accept consent as a basis to engage in activity, economic activity, um, than you would see, for example, in Europe or in Canada uh, on privacy issues. Yeah. I think there was another, saw another, yeah. Yeah. The, um I guess it, 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 Actually, could you identify, could people identify themselves, please? Yeah, yeah I'm Mark from Qualcomm. Uh, the, uh, a couple of things kind of bugged me, uh, I guess, during this talk today. There's really no talk about revocation. Everything is about prevention. Um, I think Sean's talk at Microsoft, I think wrapping the metadata with the content, I found that actually to be kind of interesting. And it reminded me of one of my pet peeves, actually two pet peeves. One is, um, and I do see this at Google. Google does a great job of making sure that Google Play is very clean, as you said, and clean all, all the malware. But 
I can, I can get a flat bird app, and then I can get an update a month from now, and all of a sudden it's asking for new permissions. And I think that's another area that needs to be managed better, um, to say, hey, look, it wasn't asking for contacts last month, but now it is. Um, another one, and Sorry, this can I ask you ask you really quick? It, you, get a, you get a notice saying that the permissions have changed, and you want to accept that or yeah. not? For, well, yes, yeah, so you get an update, you do the update, and you have to go back to the accept, but just like we're saying, nobody wants to read it the first time, who wants to read it every month when you get an update? Right, the, uh, the, the, new, the new permission forms. Okay, I guess we're just not understanding what you're proposing to change. I didn't propose a change, I'm just saying that's a, that's a uh, pet peeve. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's venting. That's him, not us. Well, actually, I talked to the lookout for a well, One thing you could do is you could say for things that are new, you could highlight them. You could say, okay, okay, I didn't notice that, so maybe you can point them out to me. Maybe it just needs to be more obvious, something I don't know. But, um, and the other one is, I can download an app, and, and I consented and said yes, I, and then try it once, say this app is crap, and delete it. And at that point in time, there's, there's, I, I feel like the license is a one-way street, and, and that's kind of taking back to the Microsoft approach. I think if you went one step further, and my data was wrapped in a certificate, and so that I could revoke it, you have digital rights with my data, so eBay screws up and all my data flies to coop, I can revoke it, whoever the hell gets it. Um, or if, um, if uh, you know, Hardly comes along and someone grabs my data again. If, I, if my data, if I own my data, so in other words, instead of giving you my data or trading you my data for a service that I may or may not like, if I own the data and I license it to you, just like you're licensing your app or service to me, that to me seems like a better, um, longer, I understand it comes from technical challenges, but I think they're solvable. And um, that's, that from a policy perspective, I like to see us, see the, the consumer own the data for the life of the data. It's interesting. I think that links to something that Norman was suggesting earlier, which is, you know, that, that's a platform issue in a way, right? It's how is, what is the platform looking like? What's the base for the platform? And how do we have an incentive structure? Or from a policy point of view, I think what you're pointing out is you're pointing out a particular kind of platform that you'd like to see. So the question is, do you target the development of the platform? Do you make the platform providers bear a responsibility that today they might not have or today they may be simply hidden and buried um, in, in infrastructure. Um, I have one thought about this, but you know, obviously how we sort of allow the consumer to use the data as a um, commodity is something that we brought out, but you know, the downside of that, and, and this may be a little bit too philosophical for some people, or maybe not relevant in, as, as a philosophical point, but you know, there are many things in our legal system that we don't commoditize for very good reasons. The Oracle Donation is the classic one, and treating individual data and, and privacy rights as a commodity is something that um, you know, one could express rights issues with, right? Because you know, there are certain things that we don't treat as money, even though they are being monetized in certain ways in the current ecosystem. Now, I don't know if I necessarily think that, um, that that's the right way to go, or that you know, the legal system should prevent that, but that is a concern that I think is a little raised with that kind of structure. So two points with the ability to take data back. One, um, I think that that would be something where I would want to start from a policy perspective rather than a technical perspective, because I don't I think it's it's cleaner when you look at I give a specific piece of data. I have a Gmail. I have an email that's sitting in my Gmail. But Delta just emailed me my flight uh, itinerary. Gmail extracts that and knows what flights I'm on, so they can remind me, yeah, the flight's later. You should leave for the airport now. I can't take that and just like encrypt it with your private key unless you want to give me your private key. At which point the whole thing is moved. So it's not quite as simple as just the data that you gave me. There's all sorts of derived data and combinations. So I think. That one, uh, I would. I agree with you. That's why we did for the policy. In, in fact, I think I think what yeah. maybe maybe if what you raised is is what Europe Europe has asked Google to do about the right, right. to be forgotten, right? To be forgotten, right? Yeah. I think that's essentially what you're asking. Well, I think the right to be forgotten well, is like it's a little deeper. But it's different. And I think that's exactly your point. It's a very that particular decision has a very nuanced statement about what's supposed to happen with. Uh, deletion of search results, and uh, it's very complicated, which mm -hmm. I think is the takeaway message from it. Yeah. And the second point, though, was there are, there are cases where you speak of the commoditization of user data, whether we like to call it that or not. Um, 
at some point, you are making an exchange. I have clicked on an ad, I have your IP address, I took your IP address so I can prove to the advertiser that I had an impression. I think we also have to recognize that in some of those cases where there is a transaction, that transaction is not necessarily reversible. I'm not saying that you should never be able to delete your email from Google or something like that, but there is a class of transactions that I think are reversible and there's a class that are not reversible. I think you have to be aware of the fact that those distinctions exist. I think we had another question. Yes. So my comments go along quite well with what Norman was saying earlier. I've interviewed about 20 app developers about their privacy behaviors, and I can quote from Hart one developer saying, he didn't need a privacy policy. No one was going to go after a small guy like me. So it's really what Norman is saying, you know, I'm too small to be looked at by regulators. And I also sort of wonder, or it seems to me from the flip side, regulators just don't have the bandwidth to go after all these startups. Um, so I, was, I would love for one of the regulators to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but sort of my assumption after that was that, well, we can't go after the small guys with poor privacy policies. We need to go after the, the parts of the ecosystem where there are fewer players. So in the ad market, that's going to be the play stores, or you know, there are even fewer ad networks than there are apps. And I would love to hear um, anyone out there respond to that idea. I, I think you from our perspective and our enforcement strategy that, that we do indeed consider the issue of, of the resources of a potential target, but we also, that can be offset by the egregiousness of the practice and potentially the widespread nature of the practice. So, so it's probably true that they may be less likely to be uh, moved against, but it's not for sure. Um, you know, one thing that I would say, I think it's a interesting point, when I think it's, um, when I noticed in uh, your quote from the app developer is that the, the danger that the app developer sees is enforcement, not consumer trust, right? And consumer trust, I think, is the other side of that. Um, you know, that's where, you know, you may be small, but if your client base um, doesn't want the, 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 the express displeasure, um, <laughs> You know that that's even that's, smaller. That's, yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a cost, and I think that you know the points that we've seen you know historically where companies change their practices or expose their doing bad practices and consumers freak out, I think emphasize that consumer trust is not some you know secondary concern that developers can make. I do agree though that I think that um, you know every stakeholder I hate that word sorry um, every person every entity that's involved in this uh, space uh, not just the regulators or you know consumer groups like mine or academics but also the companies that have um, uh, operated here have, have a role to play to kind of encourage those practices. Um, I do. I think the normal was really uh, uh, a good one that you know the larger tech companies that have had experiences um, in this vein and provide the APIs and libraries have a role to play. But I think that you know not to be too cynical, but I think having a diversity of voices, you know, communicating best practices and knowledge to um, constituents that don't have it inherently allows for. Um, a more comprehensive view because the different uh, sort of players that provide that information will have different priorities to emphasize. And, and the platform could play a pivotal role and could play a bigger way even. Yeah, so, so I don't know whether you'd be interested in the Canadian perspective, but for, from our, as a regulator, if a complaint comes in, we, we investigate each complaint um, equally, you know, whether it's a small um, organization or a larger organization. Um, in terms of overall in Canada, we have uh, overarching private sector uh, privacy legislation, so even the app developers would be covered under that. So they would have to, um, there are certain rules of when they start to collect, use, and disclose, or even retain personal information. Um, so that helps. Um, we, we also tried to do um, more of the education, and I think the, the, the question is how do you reach the app developers, right, association. But we did a lot of raising awareness um, with respect to smart meter data because we knew that the government was encouraging um, innovation through the development of applications on smart meter data APIs. Um, so we actually partnered with the government that was responsible for providing the funding 
right, to encourage this innovation, to ensure that as part of a directive, um, that they have a basic 101 in privacy. I take one more question, Fred. Uh, yeah, Fred Carter. Um, what I haven't heard today, uh, in understanding users and the tools and, and policy considerations, is the idea of promoting notice or, or transparency control after the collection. Um, so, for example, um, uh, access rights are well entrenched. Uh, Jules, you wrote a paper about it. Basically, why can't we empower individuals, consumers, to get an account of what is being done with their data? And, and, and it, it, it provides the foundation for enforcement because now those companies have to be more accountable. But perhaps after the collection, um, uh, rather than before, access rights. I think there's a question of the granularity of the detail that you want to provide. Um, something like um, Gmail, for instance, we scan over your email to look for spam. Like I think most users understand that that's kind of one of the benefits of using a web-based email provider. You know, it's a competitive feature. Uh, do we want to disclose that you know, if I were to give you a list of every single time we touch this message to scan for spam, like we update our virus definitions, we're going to scan it again. Uh, or we do processing to figure out who you email the most so that when you type in an email address, we can auto-complete it for you. And so we have a giant program that runs over all your email and does a count of how many times you email this person and that person. And I think there's a question of how do we, dis how do we convey that to a user in a way that's not just uh, I think it was Alessandro who mentioned um, when you mix in the important things with the unimportant things, you know, you yeah. sort of muddle the choice, you bury things. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real question of how do we do that in a way that's meaningful to the user and give them um, control. Like, you know, for things that we're actually, that we think are sort of at the top of users' concerns, like if you sign up for location sharing and uh, it used to be Latitude, now it's part of Google Plus, you get a monthly reminder that's saying, hey, you're sharing your your location with Google for this uh, purpose. Click here if you no longer wish to do that. I think that goes to the sort of telling users what data they're providing, but then the, the how is it used, I think that's that's really a question that we haven't figured out what is the what is the way, what is the granularity in which to convey that that's understandable to the user. I think that's actually a really good way for us to end the session, which is the, the $64 question. How do we do this in a way that is meaningful uh, to the consumer, and I'll add to that, and fair to the consumer at the same time. And that's really uh, a question that's going to keep lots of us in business for a long time to come. <laughs> and with that, I'd just like to ask you to join me in, in thanking the panel. <laughs>